Good morning, everyone. So I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of two colleagues that um, uh, I've worked on this project with. So there are three separate voices that are going to be delivered in quite different ways, and that's actually quite well suited to the, the project. But first, I want to play you the artifact that we're talking about. The artifact comes from uh, an album that we're going to call uh, Footnotes, and uh, this is a preamble that we've given when we played the whole thing. I'm actually just going to play one of the, the tracks for you, but I think it's just the first paragraph there that, that's really important at the moment. Uh, Footnotes presents the artifactual results, or perhaps more properly, the counterfactual results of a lengthy research process that has led us into various historic documents, recordings, and technologies. And um, I'll play the artifact now, and, and here is some background to it. However, all that you've heard and all that you've seen is fraudulent. There was no Big Mama Orton, nor was there a Josephine Whitcomb Foundation. No recordings were made of her at festivals in Texas or Oklahoma. There was no incoherent introduction in which Crump was shouted. There was no crowd, there was no mystery, and there was indeed no music. So, over to my colleague Bill. Someone named William Brooks wrote footnotes for solo guitar between 1981 and 1983. Another William Brooks encountered that in late 2011 after, after Stefan Asterger drew it to his attention. 
Um, quoting from Proust, people claim that we recapture for a moment the self that we were long ago when we enter some house or garden in which we used to live in our youth. But these are most hazardous pilgrimages, which end as often in disappointment as in success. It is in ourselves that we should rather seek to find those fixed places contemporaneous with different years. The first William Brooks, the, order, the author of Footnotes in the 1980s, was almost as inaccessible to the second in 2011 as Hildegard von Bingen. For him to re-enter Footnotes would have been indeed hazardous and surely would have ended in disappointment. The William Brooks of 2011 elected to uncover and speculate rather than to re-enter, and the entire album has been approached as a problem in research and invention. Research tells us that E.H. Crump ran for mayor of Memphis in 1909 and that W.C. Handy wrote a campaign song that became, with different words, the legendary Memphis Blues. Research also shows that the 1983 score for Crump is mostly derived, one way or another, from Memphis Blues. Mr. Crump's Blues then donned a mask to become Memphis Blues, and Memphis Blues donned more masks to become Crump, a movement from footnotes. Is there a single identity here, or are there several identities? Brooks in 2011 learned that Crump had first been performed on an acoustic classical guitar on November the 30th, 1981. The score was then revised in 1983 with an additional note. Different instruments with or without amplification may be used for different movements. Crump may sound best on a 12-string instrument. The classical guitar then might also don a mask, becoming something different. But it is still a guitar, right? Or is it? And the composer, who exactly is this William Brooks? He is not here, he is being impersonated, but in rediscovering the 1981 notation, he himself becomes the impersonator. What voice, what authentic William Brooks is preserved after 30 years hiatus? I contend that everything is fiction. Footnotes is all fake news. In 2011, I was prophetic but blinkered. The intended falsehoods of footnotes pale in comparison to the barrage of deceit we now encounter. This will not change. How do we respond? With an appeal to eternal truth? Or maybe with the assertion that all truths, all identities, are masks donned or removed for purely political reasons. It's the reasons, not the truths, that require scrutiny. And now I hand over to Stefan, the guitarist. The first choice in the design of the recording of each of the individual pieces and footnotes was the choice of the appropriate guitar. With Crump, I rather immediately felt that the music would sing beautifully on a 12-string guitar. Also, the octave doubling which characterizes this instrument would bring out the rhythmic complexity created through the layering of materials within the left-hand trajectories over the fretboards of the slide. While the choice of a 12-string guitar for a blues would be typical enough, this decision turned out to challenge several notions of authenticity once we found ourselves in the studio. I was to record on a borrowed instrument, since flying to the UK with something like eight instruments did not seem feasible, hence I had not tried the instrument before the day of recording. To my great discontent, when I started playing the opening bars on this new instrument, I realised that the tapping material in the opening resulted in all the wrong pitches as compared to the record of the notation. Footnote four in the first page of the piece explicates this passage in the following manner. The right hand damps all strings of the bridge, the left hand hammering on with maximum force of the fret, indicated produces a thin but clear pitch from behind the fret. The tuning of these pitches is eccentric and is only approximated in, in the notation. However, this 12-string guitar had a different scale length compared to the instrument used by the composer when composing the piece. I was strongly convinced about the overall musical result of using a 12-string guitar, but the pitches the instrument produced in the opening page were a major concern. Interestingly enough, in the studio where we were recording, I also had access to the very six-string guitar on which the composer had written the piece 30 years earlier. I immediately got this instrument out, and of course it produced exactly the pitch structure notated in the score. However, this discovery only proved that I was facing an artistic choice, which appeared to have no simple solution. Perhaps the conflicting possibilities that could be described through Peter Tibby's analytical forms of authenticity as intention and authenticity as sound referring to the higher intentions of the composer and to the original sound, such as produced with original instruments, respectively. I was not keen to perform the entire piece on this instrument since the 12-string guitar captured qualities in the composition which I found more essential than the original sonority of the composer's guitar. But also, the second footnote on the title page states that Crump may sound best on a 12-string instrument. 
Hence, in the choice between authenticity of intention or sound, the choice of 12-string guitar would relate to the former and seemed to hold several convincing musical opportunities. Still, we needed to find a solution for how to make a recording of the piece which, which did not have the wrong pitches in the opening page. This is when I got the idea of working with multitracking. If the knocking which opens the piece were to be performed on the 12-string guitar to create a continual sonic identity through the piece, then the initial tapping notes could be instead recorded separately on the six-string guitar. This could perhaps be understood as conflicting with Kibbe's category of authenticity of practice, since any recording at the supposed time of creation would have excluded such solution. It seemed easier to accept the fraud of overdubbing a supposed solo recording when A, it was not carried out with the aim of simulating the mastery of technical difficulty, and B, that the aim of the overdubbing was in fact to truthfully represent the sound structure intended by the composer. And this is about how we went about making the recording that you've just heard. Okay, so I now have a few moments um, to speak as um, the, the recording engineer uh, for this project. So how do we go about creating a recording which was supposedly made five years before I was born? Um, there's a, a line from uh, a Joni Mitchell record which says, W.C. Handy, I'm rich and I'm fay and I'm not familiar with what you play, yet when I walk down Old Beale Street, I get a strong impression of your heyday. Ghosts of the dark town society come right out of the bricks, I think. So how can we go about creating this strong impression? Um, I decided that it would be inauthentic for me to pretend that I understood and had a daily um, relationship with analog technology. So I was quite happy to use these kinds of tools. I was quite happy to uh, do the problems associated with analog magnetic tape and to embrace the undo button. So there's an authenticity in that I was using the tools that I am familiar with every day, but there is an inauthenticity in that they are not the tools that would have created the um, original artifact that we have attempted to forge. We've also used digital signal processing techniques, which either would have been in their infancy or would never have existed in, in 1967. We have used convolution a lot. The word convolution com comes from the Latin convolutio, which means to roll together. And the convolution of the performance coming out of the loudspeaker to the acoustic space in which it took place can be replicated in a different place in the recording chain. Um, by placing an acoustic signature from an outside space. And here we use um, a tool that was developed in the audio lab in the Department of Electronics at the University of York, um, which is a collection of outdoor spaces. So we can pick and choose where we wish to situate an, uh, an event. And so I'll just give you a little um, excerpt of the guitar as it was originally recorded. neutral, without any dressing, with no masks, apart from the mask of the playing and the tom of the instrument itself. <laughs> and now situated in a particular place. Very often I find myself removing noise from recording. So this is the, uh, the original uh, box or an analog tape recording made in the late 1950s of Michael Howard and performing the Palestine of Mass at Arundel Cathedral. Um, I've attempted to remove the noise from this recording using computer-based techniques, but for this particular forgery, I actually remodeled the noise that I found on here because it was from a contemporaneous analog tape. And so we scavenge, um, we, we make do, we borrow, and the idea is to create something. We, we marshal our forces something uh, akin to if we were making a film. And perhaps the, the crowd noise is too well synchronized with the events which happen in the music. But we took that as an opportunity to weave the crowd into the composition. Both Bill, who composed it, Stefan, who played it, and myself are present in the studio when all of this was done. So we have created something which we think is just a, a, another mask which gets placed over um, what Bill began in, in the uh, 1980s and the inspirations he took that were happening um, earlier on in the, in the 20th century. So there you have a very quick overview of one of the pieces from uh, Footnotes, our attempt to create from scratch place and time uh, in an audio recording. Thank you.